Imagine that there is a tree in the forest and it falls. It doesn't make a sound as it does so. This is a pretty common philosophical question that has typically a lot to do with senses and observation. But I think it's a very boring question. But we're going to talk about it anyway. For a lot of people, this philosophical question is pretty dumb. Like, what are you talking about? Does it make a sound? Well, yeah, the tree will fall down. It will create vibrations in the air, in the atmosphere. And that is what sound is. Of course it makes a sound. And they are saying that it doesn't matter if anyone hears it or not. It still makes a sound. But for this video, I want to take this philosophical concept and apply it to science. So, say that there is a scientist in the middle of the forest and they create a knowledge, but no one is around to know it. Have they done a science? Science is a very vague term for all sorts of knowledge acquiring ventures trying to gather evidence about the universe in order to increase our understanding of the world around us. There is some disagreement about whether or not science needs to have empirical evidence or not, but you know, in general, science is about trying to understand the world. And it's important to note that there are a lot of people who really like science and they have opinions on what science is. The idea is that science is very, very different from politics. Politics is opinions that's not based in empirical logic, whereas science doesn't have anything to do with politics. Merging politics and science, not allowing them to exist uh, autonomously of each other, can only serve to alter science's trajectory to the path of truth. The claim that science shouldn't be political is something that is, I think, pretty ideal. Like, science should be neutral. It shouldn't have human values associated with it. And you know, to a point that's true. But to say that science shouldn't be political is, I think, a sort of blindness of the world that we actually live within. But when people say that politics maybe should start taking a role in science, there will always be those people that say that political science is almost always evil and that it will detract from the true purpose of science, to reach truth, to strive for knowledge. And this usually also attracts comparisons to the Nazis, who, you know, did their own types of scientific pursuits in very evil ways. Okay, that, that, that's the main purpose here, and Bill Nye wants that specifically. Some examples? I know it seems tired and old hat, but let's go to Nazi Germany. That's kind of a prime example of political science, as it were. But what they misunderstand is where the problem is. The problem is not that science is political. The problem is that the politics in question in the examples that they cite are evil and, you know, that's kind of political. Scientists, people who, you know, do science, are human and everything that humans do will be in some way political. But there will be people who say then that that's not really science, that's just the structure in which science resides. There's sort of this idea that everything around science can be political, but science in itself, at its core, is objective and is supposed to be this apolitical bastion of truth and knowledge. And, you know, there's a point there. I think science should try to be that. But the thing is, nothing exists in a vacuum. And until we can somehow create an environment where no humans are involved in the pursuit of science at all, then I don't think that we can avoid politics in the process of science. But another common argument is that science doesn't really have a morality or doesn't have politics. Science is neutral, but it's a tool that people can use for good and bad. And I think this argument is kind of bullshit. 
science today is also very political, but just in slightly different ways. The society we live within currently is formed under capitalism. Like, I don't think it's a big secret that a lot of biomedical research these days is being funded by medical corporations trying to make money from it. And, you know, that's kind of political. But is that science? Or is that merely how science is applied? Sure, corporations can do things, but corporations have motives to make profit. Scientists, pure scientists, are they political too? Well, to that I say, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? I've noticed that a common problem when trying to access academic literature for researching videos or just for pure curiosity is that I can't really get that information easily anymore. When I was a university student, my university would pay for me to access all sorts of scientific and academic journals. But most people aren't enrolled in university. and Most people don't really have access to those things. And I definitely don't have access to those journals anymore. And I've realized that I've really taken them for granted in the last couple of years. And so what I and a lot of people do is take the research from journalists or other academic sources second hand. I can't really afford a subscription to Nature, but maybe you know someone who does and maybe they can like hook you up with a copy of it. But most people aren't so lucky. But what this means is that a lot of what people claim to be scientific consensus is very inaccessible to people who aren't already within academic spheres. For most people in society, what scientific consensus is doesn't actually matter at all. And that's simply because most people don't have access to that. Instead, people's idea of science matters more than the actual scientific consensus. And that has direct political implications for people in society, which we live in. So while science in theory is not political, it is in practice. I should mention though, that even the ideals of science itself as it is currently, it's not doing that great. Even as something as simple as calling something statistically significant might not actually mean anything at all. Not to mention that there are significant issues with the current peer review system, as well as the existence of shady scientific journals. What actually constitutes proper science these days is harder to discern than you might actually think. Now obviously, that's a great thing. Science shouldn't be black or white, easy answers. But at the same time, we don't really read it with that nuance in the public perception. If we consider something to have a scientific consensus, we all pretty much agree that thing to be true, even if that might not be the case. Now, if you don't know, I'm a trans woman, and that means that a lot of the time in my comments I will end up with people saying, there are only two genders, you can't change your gender, science says you can't change your gender, science is this, science is this, and the thing is, is that... <sighs> are they right? For now, let's say that the people who say this are right, that somehow some biologist somewhere looks into a my mitochondria cell and just finds like a small piece of text that says there are only two genders. Like an objective, scientific, definitive proof that there are only two sexes and that's it. I would argue, does that matter? A very common response to transphobic people trying to disprove trans people with science is that the science doesn't really agree with them. and. To a point that's kind of true, but only to a point, because I think the problem here is not really what the science says, the science has been definitive, and that brings me back to if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Some people might say that of course it makes a sound, it makes vibrations, that equals sound, definitely sound. Well, some people will say that 
sound is dependent on someone actually hearing it, and therefore it doesn't actually make a sound. The same thing still happens, the tree still falls, but the interpretation of the facts is different. The scientific community says that there are not really a binary choice, it's more of a bimodal distribution with two bell curve thingies. And this sort of pattern will repeat itself on all sorts of sexual characteristics. Characteristics that set, you know, men and women apart biologically. Things like genitals, height, secondary sexual characteristics, and everything really. But the thing is, there is an overlap. And as you probably know, there are people out there that have characteristics of both. There are several types of intersex conditions that can't neatly fall into one of the two groupings. So the problem here is, how do we interpret the data? When I, for example, read comments on videos discussing this fact, I don't really see people disputing the science itself, but they have a different interpretation of it. What they are saying is that there are two genders, and everything else are outliers, and shouldn't really be counted into something statistically significant. And this reminds me a lot of the argument that we shouldn't really accommodate things for trans people, because they're such a small part of the population, so they don't really matter. And that is a political choice. So the data itself might not be political, but how that science is taken in and used by people definitely is. And so, is science political? It all depends on context. And this is why I don't think that the scientific argument is necessarily the best one. The science has been stronger than ever, and still, you know, people become anti-vax, people deny climate change, people deny the existence of trans people. But the science has been definitive for quite a while on a lot of these things. This is where many people will argue for science communication, people being public figures and educating about the science and how it impacts the world and how everything works. But a lot of science communicators in the last couple of decades, that are famous anyway, have been people that do things like physics, environmental science, astrophysics, other physics, there's a lot of physicists, and partially, you know, that's fine. People can explore the stars and it's kind of funky to hear about space stuff, right? I like space, everyone likes space. And when it comes to people who do STEM communication, for example, that works fine when it comes to STEM subjects, like, people aren't denying science because they haven't heard the science. There are other reasons as to why they aren't believing in the scientific consensus. This is why I personally think that people should start investing more into science education in the humanities, because they deal with humans. And I'm totally not biased at all when it comes to that, because these questions of how we are supposed to interpret the data have a lot more to do with things like social constructs than you might think. And that doesn't mean it's fake, that doesn't mean it's made up, it just means that it's something that we as humans have created. And STEM fields have a really hard time tackling with these things because it's fundamentally different from what they are supposed to be doing. And that's not wrong, by the way. Like, I don't want to crack down on STEM science here, because, like, physicists and doctors and all those kinds of things, like, hell yeah, do your, do your, like, objective data thing. Yeah. Okay, you might say, after all of this. This is not really science. This is not actually science. This is just how science has been applied in society. And, you know, that's fair point. But... Can we really trust science as it's supposed to be, in its most basic form, at all? I think it's important to have a healthy skepticism of what science is, and what science actually can and cannot do. I think the first step to dealing with this is realizing that science definitely is political, but that science isn't perfect even when it tries to not be. Also, hey, speaking of communication about science, this video is sponsored by Audible. No matter what your resolution or goal is this year, you'll find the perfect audiobook at Audible to motivate and inspire you. 
Whether it's getting physically fit, financially fit, or being a better parent, leader, or person, it's all on Audible. Audio members can choose three titles every month, one audiobook, and two exclusive Audible originals you can't hear anywhere else. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial. Choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash Mia Mulder or text Mia Mulder to 500 500. That's audible.com slash M-I-A-M-U-L-D-E-R or text M-I-A-M-U-L-D-E-R to 500 a 500. If you're wondering about something that's nice to listen to, I can recommend The Future of Humanity uh, by Michio Kaku, who is one of those science uh, educators that I actually kind of like, so I would I, I'd recommend him. He's, he seems nice. And I would of course like to thank uh, everyone who's been watching this video, all of my subscribers, all of my patrons who have been helping me to do this over all of 2019. Um, and I'm very I'm very happy about what what we've made here together over 2019. And hopefully we can we can go far in in 2020. But I would like to especially thank Aini Salminen, Alexandra Dewitt, Alicia Crawford, Amalia, Amelia Fletcher, Amethyst Theraberry, Amy Seven, Anna Acrasia, Austin K, Autumn, Bo Bellamy. Catherine Stenson, Christopher Steinmuller, Dana Ferguson, Dirty Computer, Divine Yuri, Xbox, Emil Rutkowski, Emily Christ, Emily Rains, Emma Not Goldman, Fox Kant, Garrett Gutierrez, Huang Wu, Jane Lusby, Janelle Torgeson, Jessica Fletcher, Jonathan Wardrell, Josh Les, Josie Volps, Jürgen Danielsen, Kitchens, LPQ Silver, Linus 2.0, Michelle, Miles Lampert Gillum, MSG, Nicholas Trevino, Patrick Stack, Phobos2390, Riley Knox, Safi Huck, Sashka Aurelia, Scary Sun, Thoros of Mir, Tiffany A, Uncle Cheese, Rosie, Vinder, and Vivian Crow. Thank you.